afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us today for lunch, and in particular for joining us for the Conference on High Impact Research. Um, I understand from the sessions that I wasn't in this morning that all of them have been really good, and that um, there have, it's different than last year's a little bit, and we will put it together a planning committee very soon to think about next year's conference. So you can expect that this same day, the day after commencement, is likely to be another conference on high impact research. I'm Nancy Davenport, I'm the university librarian, and I'm happy to have all of you here today and to have this special panel to talk to you. Our first speaker is going to be Scott Bass, the provost of American University. And, and Scott's been here for 10 years, and through those 10 years, he has led this university to have a deeper impact in research, to achieve a higher rating as a research university, and it cares passionately about the reputation of this institution and the individuals who work there. Today, his talk is going to be about your research and the impact of that research and how our international rankings are established and what that means for recruiting faculty, postdocs from Europe, as well as recruiting graduate students or even undergraduates. He will go through the various markers that we have influence over. There are some that, that we don't have as much influence, but the role of research and its impact is one that we individually and collectively can influence. Scott? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> thank you. Um, I think it's a, a terrific introduction. Thank you. And I should also mention, you know, we've just gone through five graduation ceremonies <laughs> in the last few days. And um, actually, there's one more next weekend for the law school. Um, and I should mention that the chair of our board of trustees, Jack Cassell, has agreed to join us after five graduations. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jack. Uh, and, I, and I should just say just the dedication of time he's committed to the institution. And I know he cares passionately about uh, the institution. has been a generous donor. He grew up on the campus. His father was a an important historic figure uh, in the university, and um, actually uh, someone who also cares deeply about the reputation uh, of the institution and how it's viewed externally and how we position ourselves uh, as an organization. And that has, uh, has evolved over this uh, last 10 years, uh, but by no means are we in a position of uh, resting on those laurels. Um, and I'm just counting the number of PhDs we gave uh, over this last <laughs> couple of days because there's a minimum number, and we're, we're right near the minimum to even be in our research classification. So the importance of, uh, of our doctoral work, um, which we don't talk a lot about, is critical to the status of the institution. Um, so in terms of high impact research, I think uh, Nancy hit the nail on the head. I, I want to talk about how we're perceived internationally and the ranking organizations, whether you like it or not, how the ranking organizations look at this institution. And so um, there are, and I'll go over, there are um, a number of ways we can talk about high impact research. There are just, just many ways we can, can think about it. And the most obvious way is where the books you use, the journals that you attach things to, and the impact of those journals. But it's secondary, I mean, it's very important, but it's simply a proxy for what's most important is that people are reading your work and they're citing it. And so we've had um, too much of a history of publishing in places that may be easier or convenient, but the issue is it being read by many others and then cited. So citations, you'll see it's an important measure that others use, whether you like it or not, as others use to determine the productivity, the research prowess of an institution. Also. Uh, we've talked about for artists and, and others, musicians, performances, is there are prestigious juries. And it's not just having your work reviewed by jury, but it is the stature of that uh, jury, the level of influence of that work that really reflects back on the institution. That there is, um, there are now, uh, which the library has been very helpful with, are altmetrics. But those altmetrics really reflect to these uh, other categories um, and certainly uh, one area we often talk a lot about because it provides other benefits to the institution is our externally funded grants, again, from prestigious uh, organizations that are highly competitive, that are highly prized uh, for their funding. 
and we're below where we'd like to be in that category. It has improved, but it's still not where we would like to be. Um, there are major, for those in certain fields, the major media that your work is uh, prominent in, that you are uh, at major press conferences, you're speaking on uh, television on national, on the national issues of the moment. Uh, those are in other ways to, and the institution is featured. You'll also see often when uh, the spokesperson from, um, say, the Kennedy School, in the background it says the Kennedy School all over the place because it's a way of recognizing that institution and um, as much as we speak about our uh, public uh, presence, um, it's still a shadow of where we can be and should be given what we, we are actually working on. Um, it's at, uh, in terms of recognition by your peers, they say this is really important work and we see that in some of the letters that come in for tenure or promotion files. They're saying, your colleagues are saying this is really important work. Those, those are important because they then reflect on the institution. Of course, the major prizes um, that are widely recognized as the highest achievements in their field, um, those, those go a long way and then also has a spin for uh, the institution. I don't want to uh, omit patents and licenses. Uh, we have three patents this year uh, and we are, uh, those are other ways that really uh, generate interest and certainly uh, potential revenue. And then there's when teams come together, uh, the LIGO in physics is a team, you know, thousands of researchers around the world. But on our scale, it might be a team of a dozen from other universities that are, have major funding on a major question, and our institution is representing. I mean, for an engineering, NSF has it called an, in, an engineering research center, and, you know, it's Princeton and the, a number of institutions, six or seven institutions that have partnered. Well, those kinds of grants exist in many fields, and being on those teams uh, with other uh, prominent institutions helps uh, in terms of the impact. But I'm really going to talk about in a very narrow question is what is used in international rankings. <coughs> and that there's two uh, prominent ones. There's also U.S. News, and I'm, I'm going to hold on that one, is the Wall Street Journal Times Higher Ed is a, a newer player. And they describe themselves as a de de definitive list of the world's best universities evaluated across uh, the teaching, research, and international outlook, reputation, and more. And this is what they're saying to pro prospective students, undergraduates. And I, and I have to tell you, for internet, those of you who work in the international arena, the ranking of the institution is very important uh, to families. Um, it, it is a vital source for students helping them know where to study. Again, it's a vital source for students helping them know where to study. So how you come out on this is going to influence some choices. The second um, uh, ranking system that's out there is QS World University Rankings, and their motto is discover the world's top uh, universities. So I'm going to show you sort of where we are and how, we, how we're looked at and what's the criteria. So Times Higher Ed ranking criteria, all right? And so they list it as teaching, and again, these are weighted criteria. So this one's 30%, and um, if you look how it breaks down, they do a reputational survey, not unlike U.S. News, they do a reputational survey, and that's 15%, and then they break it down. It's actually the use staff to student they're really talking about. I've read the materials. It's faculty to student ratio. Here, everyone see that? It's faculty to student ratio. Um, it's not really uh, staff. Um, it's the, then the um, doctorate to bachelor's. And in faculty student, we do well. Uh, doctorate to bachelor's, uh, very poor. We're very weak on that. We're, I say we're around 25 PhDs a year compared to our undergraduates. <coughs> it's very imbalanced. The, um, we have the, uh, what is the next one? Doctorates awarded, uh, which is another percentage, and then the institutional income, which we would probably do all right in terms of our overarching. So 30%, what they call teaching, but it's not exactly uh, as we think of it. In terms of research, um, you'll see 30% also, which is the um, first is another reputational survey. Uh, so again, it's sent worldwide, people fill it out. And there'll be variability from year to year in terms of your scores and your ranking. But few have really been to this campus and have much of an idea, but that's the way it's done. Research income, uh, which is an area that we'd like to see grow. And then the research productivity. So research uh, for us 
um, as to who we are uh, is going to have some variability. We already talked about the teaching isn't exactly how we think of teaching. Research um, is pretty standard. 30% goes to citations. Okay, so I can't tell you how important that is, whether we're talking about U.S. News or any of these. 30% of the weighting goes to citations. And then um, if smaller numbers are, have to do with the international um, status of faculty, staff, and students, um, and then the uh, in income from industry, which we really don't have that uh, sector um, at this point um, in terms of our portfolio. So that's the Times Higher Ed. <coughs> you see the this, but this is then the material that's placed out in terms of eventual number. So in this categorization, um, the question would be what is our ranking, and they break it out by U.S., and then they break it out by international. So our ranking, U.S., and you know where we are at U.S. News, we're about 69 uh, in terms of that ranking and hopefully uh, moving up. Uh, our U.S. ranking in this particular sector is 198. Uh, we are tied with Catholic, we're tied with Rutgers, New York, and St. Mary's College in Indiana. Now, is that who you think we are? But that's who our metrics are revealing. So in terms of world ranking, this is our score. It's somewhere between 351 and 400. It's a lump group of many institutions that have a similar index, uh, and that's where we are. So. Um, that's out there. It's been out there. It's out every year, <coughs> updated every year. Uh, we've improved some, um, but that's where we are. Second that I wanted to highlight is uh, QS World Rankings. And um, their uh, metrics are a little different, their methodology. 40% um, goes to the academic reputation, which is, again, a uh, survey. Uh, and they also do that for the employer, which is a smaller percentage, the employer reputation, which is 10%. 40%, 20% goes to the student-faculty ratios. 20% um, is citations per faculty. 5% are the international students, and 5% of international faculty. Again, heavy weighting on very whether you again whether you like it or not on traditional research measures. Um, and there's, this is our rank: is 471 to 480 in that. A cluster. You can see there's been variability uh, over time uh, in terms of that, and I think it probably has to do with the reputational surveys we've slipped um, this year in their rankings. And it may may pick up again just who receives the surveys and fill it out. There there isn't dramatic changes. We've had improvements in uh, citations uh, per faculty and overall citations, um, but uh, this particular one breaks it down by. Um, the global average, in other words, if you're at zero, that's the average na uh, worldwide, and you'll see sort of where we are in terms of just getting to uh, the average, the below average in terms of world comparisons on these metrics. And then within the United States, and this one does trouble me more, uh, is within the United States, we're well below uh, the domestic average on those uh, indices, and they go further and they give it by indicator what our actual score was. And so uh, this is out of, of, of 100 points. Uh, so you'll see we're on academic reputation. Uh, okay, you know, we came out in the bottom quartile. Uh, employer reputation, we came out in the middle. Citations per faculty, 10% uh, or 10. Um, then faculty student ratios, international faculty, international students. So what they then take that, and I'm just going to show you because they broke it out on easy to see format, is they then break it out to the weighting. And so you see where the scale is. And the scale is on 100 points where we would be um, in terms of the weighting. And so uh, acu the, the acumentric, acu academic reputation, the employer uh, reputation, citations per faculty, which is quite low, uh, the faculty student ratios and international students, that com comes to a composite when you weight it to a score of 26.5 out of a score of one. There is that, this is based on an institution that has a score of 100. Um, so uh, I, I think for this kind of talk in terms of high impact research, um, it's not just a self-defined, um, it is also how the world de defines these things. And so I ask uh, two questions. Uh, how will this ranking look to a 
prospective international student. Um, and I think this is just the, the reality. This is what they would see uh, in terms of our profile in two different ranking systems that uh, others take seriously. Um, and then the second question would be, what are the major measures to which we can influence? And um, in this group and in this campus, this is really within, I mean, we're not going to influence the, uh, the, the reputations right away. But there are metrics here that are uh, eminently doable that we pay attention to. We p we're publishing at a tremendous level on this campus. The research activity is at a very high level. I, I can assure you no, one, uh, no one's been uh, tenured without extraordinary accomplishments in, in these areas. So I, I, I say this particularly to this audience is this is important. It's a view not just about your own work, but it's a view of the institution itself and how we think of ourselves and what we value in terms of our prowess and our communication to international students, which we definitely want to grow. The board has asked us to go international students. Or our domestic students, they have confidence they're coming to an institution that is widely respected in terms of these uh, traditional uh, measures. Um, with that, that's really all I wanted to say. And, and uh, I don't know if Nancy, if you want to do any questions now or wait until the other presenters. Uh, do mind no, I don't mind waiting. Thank you. Just a few words of introduction, um, and this is not going to be your standard introduction because based upon the talk that the provost just gave, we decided to look at citations of our two speakers and see where they were. <laughs> and luckily, we can point with great pride to both of you. Um, so Jeff's, <laughs> it's, you, don't, you do not need an escape door. Um, you have 137 publications. And as of a week ago, you had 3,544 oh, right. citations. <laughs> he was one of three primary authors of a 2014 article that was in Lancet Neurology that was recognized as the most important contribution to the field of pediatric neurocritical care at the, at the Outlook to the Future Plenary Session of the World Congress on Pediatric Intensive Critical Care. You have eight monographs that were published by SAGE, CRC, Cambridge, Wiley, and Westview. Your highest publication is actually a textbook, which has been used over and over again, Bayesian Methods, um, with a, a social and behavioral science uh, approach, a statistics textbook in its third edition with a 1,000 citations. But you publish in a whole lot of different fields. When I talked to Jeff and asked him to be a part of this panel, he said, he said, why me? And I said, well, we've got a scientist and I want a social scientist. He said, I'm a social scientist, but I spend a lot of time with sciences. And today he's not going to talk about the project that really intrigued me the most. He will talk about terrorism and a way of, of analyzing your, your, your way through some of this. But he's also working on a synthetic blood project, which at first sounded like, huh? And afterwards you thought, my goodness, blood that could be your blood blood that would come without transfusions, without anything carried along with it, if you could have synthetic blood. <laughs> As a woman who has two artificial knees, I'm ready for it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on my way to being bionic, so I'm, <laughs> I'm ready for you. Um, one of his, his citations is probably one of the funniest one, if you, if you think about this very carefully, that speaks to the difficulty of his work. And this book review says, Autodidactic, with the requisite background in calculus, statistics, and linear algebra, probably would get the greatest benefit out of Gill. Meaning, autodidactic, meaning those who are self-taught. But if you are self-taught in calculus, statistics, and linear algebra, 
Um, you're a mighty strange person. <laughs> so you have been a awarded over $15 million of grant funds up until this time with your principal funders being NIH, DOD, and NSF. We're delighted to have you come home, having earned your PhD here. Thank you. Please. I was hoping she'd just keep going and I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, I learned something, actually. Um, I don't count okay. very well. I think so. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the, um, the affiliations up here uh, are a little deceptive. I like to say I study humans. And I study humans uh, socially, politically, and biomedically. And I think today is going to be all three in some senses. So, whoops. so here's a problem. Um, this slide basically says that um, terrorism is bad <laughs> and that governments spend a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort worrying about it. Um, it's bad in many ways. Um, that is, what terrorists, the real motivation for terrorists is not killing people. That's just an intermediate goal. It's to make people feel like their government can't protect them and therefore affect change in that government. Okay? So we worry about things like personal safety, um, epidemiological concerns. Um, you know, the, how the public perceives terrorism is essential, and that's actually why airplanes make great weapons for terrorists. Um, so th the problem with studying terrorism is the data are really difficult to deal with. In fact, they're the worst kind of data I know of. Um, they consist of only published events. We don't know what goes on in a classified environment. Um, government's actions are often hidden to us. The tools for filling in missing data are generally not appropriate. Um, qualitative and quantitative experts on this literature often don't talk to each other. And it can even be physically dangerous. I wanted to go to Northern Ireland and interview people, and I was told I couldn't by my former university professor. Um, so here's a really quick example, because I only have a few minutes. Um, here's some data it, it from, um, it's, that's where it's from, but it's really from the Israeli government. And this, these are suicide attacks on the first intifada some few years ago. And from this data set, we get information about the attack type, the target, the device, and so on and so forth. And then we get casualties. Now, this is difficult data because the measurement is very non-granular, lots of zero, one variables, um, uh, uh, very lopsided variables. Attack is at attack with a boat. It was, there was only two out of 103, things like that. Um, and we also don't get to see the planning and other mechanisms. Still, this is the easiest data set I know of in this literature. And so we can look at it graphically. These are neat things. These are called coplots. <clears throat> you can't read this because I can't even read this. <laughs> this is casualties, and this is log age of the first attacker. Okay, so these are really neat things, these coplots, because we can look at graphs by segmenting on some other variable. So this is why they don't attack military targets, right? They're not very successful, if you want to define success for a, terrorism, a terrorist. Um, you can also see that when the attacker is challenged, right, there are many fewer casualties. Um, cars are not particularly good devices in, in a setting like this. And Hamas is clearly more successful than non-Hamas groups in, this, in these data. So what all of these things do is they suggest that we can go to a regression model. So I'm going to do that. So here's a basic, basic model with a, with a little extension. Um, so Y is an outcome. That's going to be people killed. OK, just to count. X beta are a bunch of explanatory variables. OK, you should never use the phrase independent variables in the social or biomedical sciences because they don't exist. Um, so that X beta is the standard linear regression thing to do that you've probably seen. But I'm going to add an enhancement to make this a generalized additive model. That summation over F, these are terms that can't be linearly associated with the outcome that I care about. That is, they're curvilinearly associated. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a smoother over two parameters to make the model fit better and learn something about those two variables that I would not have otherwise learned. Um, and so um, everybody should know R. I'm not joking. <laughs> um, so here's my model after I did that. Um, and so it's a linear model for the most part, so we can talk about it in a very easy way. So when the attacker is challenged, about four people die less okay, in expectation. Um, when the target's a cafe, about four more people are die in expectation. When the target is military, it's about five less. When Hamas is responsible, it's about four more. Pretty straightforward stuff, interesting stuff. We just learned something about terrorists in this setting. Um, but I also did this smooth that I was talking about over age of first attacker, 
and um, the log of date. And so we don't get a term here. This just says it fits nicely. So I, I'm going to graph it. So what do I have here? This is a smoother over those two terms, holding the other terms constant. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> How do I fix that? This is not deducted from my time, is it? <laughs> Did I do something? OK, now we have, we have an expert. Uh, So if I did have that up here, <laughs> what you would see is that um, throughout the time of the first intifada, the effectiveness of young people went up and then it went down. Okay? Um, there's no data for the older people in the early phase because there weren't any. These are people who are willing to strap a bomb to themselves and walk into a cafe. Right? So you have to convince them that it's worthwhile to kill themselves and others. Um, and so what you see for the older people is it continually goes up. So it turns out that in the first intifada, they ran out of competent young people that were willing to do that, and then they started relying upon older people. Um, so, and then I rotated the graph, and it looked really nice. <laughs> <laughs> we promise. <laughs> well, I could take questions. I guess like that. Unfortunately, it went out on a graph, which is like the worst sign, right? Yes. My recollection, we have to wait. Oh, there it is. Let me go back. Was, was it statistically reliable? Let's see. Yeah. So there's no evidence either way. Um, OK, so th there's that curvilinear effect that you see. You would not have discovered this trying to, to, to model it conventionally. So that's interesting. Um, here I'm just rota rotating it around. So you get a clear angle for how the young people got less effective over time. Um, OK, so it turns out that's an easy case. One country, all the data are known. Uh, all the events uh, are observable, so on and so forth. The really tough thing to do in this literature is to figure out heterogeneous effects that you don't see directly, okay? That is, uh, things that are hidden in the explanatory variables or not in the explanatory variables, how do you get at that unobserved heterogeneity? So a few years ago, George Casella and I developed some tools for this. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a standard linear model like that, linear additive structure, and we're going to first think about what's called a random effect. That psi, that thing that looks like a pitchfork, um, that's going to be, if you knew the groups, you could bin them into their groups, and you could estimate how different those groups are. That is, if you're in group three, everybody in group three gets a, uh, an effect that's the same, in addition to their other covariates or explanatory variables. OK, but that's not helpful because we've got people who don't want to be observed in groups. So we developed this thing called a Dirichlet process random effects model. And what we do, okay, it's supposedly non-parametric, that's not the greatest name in the world, is uh, we're going to computationally bin people into groups, okay, based on their covariates over and over and over again, okay, through what's called a Markov chain Monte Carlo sampler, okay. And in doing so, we're essentially averaging over that heterogeneity, and it doesn't hurt us in the model. Okay, I could, I could spend another hour on that, but I won't. <laughs> um, so he, here's, a, here's an application. Um, so Dick Cheney very famously said at one point that democracies invite terrorism, which is kind of disingenuous because it means if you're a totalitarian government, you're better. You're better off, right? Um, so let's test that. Here are 22 Asian countries over uh, 1990 to 97, okay? Um, so the outcome is whether there was a major terrorist event, 67 yes and 83 no in a country year, okay? Um, we want some explanatory variables. 
So the first one is basically how democratic is the country. The second one is do the subnational governments also have taxing and spending and regulatory power, like we have in the United States. Um, there's also one about how close the government is to the people, essentially, structurally, and then whether or not there are territories that that country has that they don't control, like Moro Island in the Philippines is, is an example. Okay, so let's let's uh, uh, now we're gonna have to make another, another enhancement. I'm gonna run a logic regression model. Not that big of a difference. I'm just gonna model the log likelihood instead of the actual y's. Okay, and that means I go back to my linear additive structure. There's my Dirichlet process in red right there. Okay, um, these are very common models in, in the social sciences, uh, except for the Dirichlet process part. Well, it turns out, I've made them in orange there, uh, that the more democratic you are, the more terrorist attacks you're going to have. So Dick Cheney was right, at least in this regard. Not that that's prescriptive in any way. Um, and also, the closer the government is to the people structurally, the less terrorist attacks, and that's kind of anticipated as well. Um, so what causes the terrorist to use suicide attacks? Well, suicide attacks are worse because uh, they're easier to plan in some senses. There's no escape route that gets worried about. Um, there's more control over when and where it happens. Um, you don't have, uh, they're, they're very rarely multiple events that require coordination. Um, so I've got some data here uh, from, let's see, 19, should be 90 something. Oh, 98 to 2004. Um, 98 was a really bad year for terrorism. The East Africa attacks, you may remember. But we forgot about that after 9-11, by the way. Um, so um, we took out Al-Qaeda because they're special during this era. You can leave them in if you want, but it, it sort of mixes things in an in a uncomfortable way. And then we have a set of covariates that you sort of uh, suspect. I'm not going to go through all of these. Things like the type of weapon, uh, uh, whether uh, it's a multi-party event, a multi-incident event, and so on and so forth. Um, but this is an important one here. This is what I was talking about when I said terrorists don't kill people for the sake of killing people. They kill people because they want us to feel unsafe, that our government can't protect us. So these, the people that coded this data set included that, that in here with the psychosocial variable. Okay, so run that Dirichlet process model in the logic case, right? And we see that throughout the time period, um, casualties are going up per incident. Uh, Multi-incidents are going down reliably. Multi-party are going down reliably. Weapon type, the, the bigger the bomb, right, the more the damage is basically what that says. Uh, that's not rocket surgery or anything. Um, and then you can see the psychosocial variable is actually reliable and composite, right? So this is really what, what they're up to. Okay, so having done that, we also went and added a substantive clustering. So what the model's gonna do in the process of this sampler moving around the posterior is we're going to estimate a cluster and, and then see how effective it is, <coughs> then get another cluster, see how effective it is, and then see how many times the model comes back to the same cluster configuration. I'm grossly oversimplifying. Um, but the point is that we're making the cluster configurations a random component to be estimated, okay? The actual clusters. Terrors like to cluster, they like to interact, they like to imitate each other, so that, that's a good thing to do. But we're also keeping the Dirichlet process in there as well. Okay. Um, so here's, here's some bad data, <laughs> literally. Big, allied, and dangerous, right? So the, the bad data, I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna model fatalities, okay? Um, we have uh, almost 400 lethal attacks, um, and we have the following uh, covariates. So state sponsorship, that's, that's usually an important one, like whether or not that terrorist group has a gov government backing it, right? Um, uh, Mass, this cow code just gives where it's at. Um, that stands for correlates of war. Um, th there's an ordinal variable for the size of the terrorist group, whether they possess territory. That's actually an important one as well, as opposed to being ephemeral. So what ISIS was really all about was controlling some territory from which they could then do other things. Uh, fortunately for us, that didn't work out for them. Um, the number of connections they have in a network sense. Um, uh, only a political scientist can make up a variable, left, no, religion, ethno. <laughs> okay, and, and make it this complicated. This has to do with the confounding uh, of ideology and, um, and, and eth ethnic background, basically. Um, whether they're purely a religious group, purely an ethnic group, whether they're an Islamic group. 
Okay, so we run that model, okay, that Dirichlet process model uh, with the subsequent cluster. And cluster space is gigantic, okay? So the number of possible clusters that I could have here is actually a bell number of order 10, okay? And that's uh, a little more than the number of known stars in the universe, okay? So this thing took five days to run. And I can't go everywhere, but I can go to the most likely places. I'm, again, I'm, I'm grossly oversimplifying. And it turns out about 45% of the time, we got this cluster configuration here, which is really neat. That this, is, this is enormously lucky, successful, whatever, given the, that bell space that I was talking about. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to now run a regular linear model, like I would if I wasn't doing all that fancy stuff that we invented. Um, and then I'm going to take those four clusters and then I'm treat them like four random effects and estimate them, which are those alpha one through alpha fours there. Okay? So um, this is interesting. I, I did these things in orange just to contrast them. So state sponsorship in the literature uh, is, is considered an important variable, but there's no evidence it matters in the regular model. But when we account for those four groups, it's an important and statistically reliable effect. That's called the highest posterior density interval. And if it doesn't bound zero, then you can claim that there's evidence of an effect. Okay? So there's a big effect for that variable accounting for those groups. Okay? Terror is strong. Well, it turns out it's less important than ignoring the groupings. So there's two key variables in the literature where we have two really different stories depending on just running a naive model and a model that pays attention to clustering and, and the Dirichlet process subclusters. The other thing is, you can see that one of the groups is much more deadly than the others, right? In fact, there's an underachiever at, at alpha one, right? <laughs> um, so so what, what do you do at this point? Well, you, you go and you look at what's in that group, what terrorist organizations are in that grouping, and you can make policy decisions or strategic decisions based on that. So if you're affected by alpha four group, you really want to worry about them, right? And that's what that says. And since I have an incredibly limited time, in fact, I thought I had an hour until about three days ago. <laughs> and, and so um, I'll take the hour if, if, if you'll give it to me, but I better not. presentation, let me talk to you about him through his citations as well. Um, 10 of the 33 articles you've ha published in the past 10 years have citation counts that place him in the top 10% of neuroscience and behavior disciplines, with three of those in the top 1%. His article in Nature, Real-Time Prediction of Hand Trajectory by Ensembles of Cortical Neurons in Primates, has been cited 1,500 times. Your uh, publication count... I'm a middle off on that one. <laughs> <laughs> your publication count is 57, but your citation count is 4,457. I actually went up by three, because I checked it again this morning, and you were up by three more points. Um, he's published three articles in Nature, which by itself has an impact factor of 40, and that is the 10th highest impact factor for any journal. One article in Science, which has an impact factor that is the 16th highest overall. It's an impact factor of 37. And you have two in Nature Neuroscience, which is an impact factor that is the 72, 72nd highest impact factor. And to, to make your librarian's heart go pity pat, you have published six times in open access. And um, <laughs> as all the librarians applaud you. <laughs> And, and, in, and if there were a perfect world in which open access literature had as strong an impact factors as these very prominent journals behind a paywall, <laughs> the provost too would be applauding because it, our money comes from his budget um, in order to build the library that both of you want us to have. What is it that makes Pendulous an open access library? Um, commercial access is simply that. We pay for it and we pay very high prices for academic literature. The, the model, as the librarians like to tell the story, is that the, the university hires distinguished faculty who will produce really wonderful work, path-breaking work, that then is, it goes to a journal 
who not only takes the piece, it usually takes the intellectual property as well. And so the faculty member gives up one's intellectual property to the publisher. Publisher does some cute stuff around the sides of it and maybe edits it a little bit, but in essence, we then buy it back at a very high price. And the higher the prestige ranking of the journal, the prominence of the journal, the narrowness of the topic, the higher the price. Um, I thought Scott Bass was going to, was going to fall over when I told him that the first journal in neuroscience that we had to buy was $50,000 a year. Um, and I think it was published nine times a year. I think Rachel remembers this, but we had to get a journal that was, that was relatively very expensive when we brought in the first neuroscientist. No, no, you, wa you weren't the first. We don't blame it on you. <laughs> <laughs> but but once you buy once you get two people and then you divide the cost by two and as you bring more neuroscientists we can keep you know s expanding that cost gap um, and it, open access means that the publishing always has cost you need to figure out what those costs are and now rather than having libraries buy it back at a very high price once the article has gone through the peer review process and it goes to publication there are what are called author publication fees and um, some authors cough them up themselves. This library has chosen to set aside a small portion, about $30,000, $25,000 worth of what we would purchase materials with. We've set aside for fees, and our librarians have put together a very strict criteria that it has to be in a peer-reviewed publication. It has to meet certain other criteria before we would give out the money. And this past year, we have funded two publications that required author processing charges. Um, but that's the short story of, of how you buy it cheaper and how you buy it more expensive. But our, our job is to get what you, the scholars, need. With that, Mark, Thank podium you. is yours. Okay. Thank you, Nancy, for the opportunity to speak, and thanks for coming. Um, yeah, so the journal thing I just want to comment on, because for us in the lab, it's kind of a trade-off. There's a big social media debate about whether a postdoc or a grad student should publish in one of these, what many people call blue soup journals now, in neuron and current biology and nature and neuroscience, or uh, the Journal of Neuroscience, eLife, another fantastic open journal that does cost a lot, but it's reviewed by scientists. The entire editorial board, editorial board are scientists. And um, the reviews are published, which I've been using in a couple classes with grad students and even undergrads to read about the process and have them write journal reviews. Um, and I'm wondering, really, the time has come to move past those, those expensive journals. There's also, uh, I'm not going to get into it here, but BioArchive, another uh, preprint server that has started. And many people in our lab as well are putting our papers there first before they're peer reviewed. You get it out immediately, you get a citation. Then you can send it to a journal even from the BioArchive website. And it's really been a, a, an expediter for getting results out there as fast as possible, which is really what we all want. Um, we always end up having to change what we say when we get reviews. And it helps the process. The papers are better. But for the people involved, sometimes it can take a year or more to get a paper published in one of those journals. So anyway. Um, yeah, I'm, I have a light talk. I'm going to tell you about a project called Open Behavior. My lab um, moved here now for the fourth year. Um, the Center for Behavioral Neuroscience, Department of Biology, and an Asbury building. This is just a little snapshot of data. This is uh, what we do in our lab is we put electrodes in the brain. We put in things that do things called optogenetics. I'll show you some videos of that. And this is a recording of um, a local field potential, or an LFP, in the brain of a rat. It's like an EEG in a human. And the rat is licking to ingest a reward that has sucrose in the water solution, and the rats like sucrose. And we look in their brain for markers that this kind of licking behavior might make that part of the brain go nuts. And so this, these signals you can see have little waves around when the rat's licking. And you can do some spectral analysis. I won't get into, into de details on it. It shows that basically this yellow means that there's an entrainment of these waves to the rat's licking. And when, they're, when, when the brain area is active, the neural signals are entrained to the rat's licking cycle. We can turn the area off with a drug called Mucimol. It makes cells stop firing. The entrainment goes down. We can give the animal a peptide called, called ghrelin that makes you feel hungry, and the entrainment goes up. And we're using these kinds of very simple methods, and actually not pretty complicated, but simple in current neuroscience, to try to understand value-guided decision. Do you want to do this to get a reward? Do you want to do that to get a reward? What happens when the world changes, and you have to change what you do? We work on a part of the brain, prefrontal cortex in rat. We have it also in human. It's much larger in us. It's the very front part of the brain. That's about all the neuroscience I'm going to go through today. This is what we do in the lab. But to do these experiments, we need to make a lot of things. It takes a lot to set up a lab. And traditionally, people build their rig, as we call it, to do your experiment. Then your person moves on. The rig becomes a mess. No one ever repl replicates it again. 
No one shares the designs. You just kind of describe it in text. No one really shows you how they made the parts. There's no movies. There's no instruction manual. And a lot of intellectual property basically is lost. Every time someone leaves a lab, it's gone. You never see the experiment done again. So we started a website a couple of years ago to share devices that people are now publishing and making readily available. So it's called Open Behavior. And it's hosted through the university's EdSpace account. This, for example, is software called Bonsai used by a lot of labs to track motion. So here's a rat walking, and the rat may be treated with different things like you know, maybe it's Parkinson's disease, or someone might look at sensory integration as it walks. And you can track the animal's position in space very reliably in real time. It's developed by a postdoc um, who's in Portugal, and it's completely open source. And you can download it and use it for free. I bought a commercial package to do exactly this. It costs quite a bit of money, and um, we struggle with the data files. Uh, there's really no good manual for it. This one person has written the software and given all the instructions away, and it's very easy to do. And students in the lab like using it. So Banzai, um, this is a system called PulsePal for controlling electrical or optical pulses when we do brain stimulation. You can download the instructions and build this yourself, or for about $100, a company in Germany will make this for you and send it to you. A commercial system for something like this, hard to do for most people, it's going to cost a couple hundred dollars in instruments alone. And this is an entire behavioral system for testing mice. And a little, these are little choice ports that the mice will go to. They'll smell odors and make a choice about which response option they have. It's all being controlled by a small little box that has something called an Arduino inside of it. This entire system costs 100 bucks, And it's made by a postdoc who left Cold Spring Harbor and started a company in his apartment on Long Island. And he now distributes to a whole bunch of labs. Um, we wanted to get this stuff out there. We were making a lot in our lab. One of our collaborators was making a lot. I'll tell you a little bit of the backstory on that. And we got the website launched. And then, as I'll get into, something called the Brain Initiative, people who are funding a lot of neuroscience from President Obama's administration came along and realized they weren't really funding behavior. So would we apply to try to get support for this to turn it into a larger scale project and really disseminate the training materials and instruction manuals on these kinds of tools and raise, in a sense, the level of research that's going on right now. Things are cheap, but you also get them quick. You can use them in a paper that came out last week. You can do the experiment in your lab next week. And so I'll just tell you about that project, the Open Behavior Project. The people involved, and this is in our, our lab, um, myself, two fantastic now graduates, Hannah Goldbach and Samantha White, who yesterday received their degrees in neuroscience, and two of our PhD students, Kyra Swanson and Linda Amirani. And on the wall, <laughs> it's Photoshop, is our collaborator, Lex Kravitz from NIH, who actually had the idea of starting this to begin with. Um, what we've been doing um, really started when we moved to AU, that these kinds of devices have become really common in research. Maybe you've heard of them. We have a wonderful, I'll show, okay, um, here, I'll just jump ahead and I'll come back. Don Myers' facility now has an entire center called Dabble that's been built. It's fantastic and a beautiful shop for Jonathan uh, Newport, who makes a lot of things here for physics and also with us. Um, and the students in the university now are learning how to do these things in Dabble. It's a, it's a really awesome facility. Um, when I came, this stuff was really breaking out. So Arduinos, $22, a small little digital processing board. You can control your garage door with it. You can have your lights turn on when you come home. You can save power on your refrigerator. And you can control these little ports that mice go to and respond in and, and give a reward when they enter the port. 22 bucks. The newer generation called a Tinsy. It's even smaller, a lot more power. The software open sourced um, an integrated development environment or an IDE for Arduino. Download it and you can start making circuits on your own right away. A lot of kids are doing this at home too. Pixie camera made by grad students at Carnegie Mellon. A little tiny board that has a camera on it. It tracks colored objects in real time. So robots like this can be controlled by, by colored objects. And you can track animals with little tiny red mark or blue mark on their head as they move around the environment with this camera. And it's, and again, like 50 bucks to do it as opposed to $10,000 for a really sophisticated <laughs> tracking system. A lot of these tools come from 3D printing. This is an Ultimaker that we have in our lab. And software like Blender, you can make 3D models and then print them. So people are basically doing it themselves. But we're not sharing enough, and that's been our point. <clears throat> when I came, I had to teach a course. So um, what, what can I do? Something, let's try. Um, our neuroscience major is new. They need, they need to learn how to program. They need to learn how to do circuits. We do it in the lab all the time. So I, I started a course that's now been called Computational Methods. And here's some kids taking the class last year. They work with Arduinos, they make circuits, they do experiments in class. They end up doing a reaction time experiment on themselves where they measure their responses to flashing lights. They learn to program in something called Jupyter, which is a Python language. 
uh, interface and they learn to analyze their own data. They learn how to make publication quality figures. All this stuff was kind of coming when we moved here. And um, I'll jump over to Dabble now. One of the first students to take the class, Michael Preston, who graduated two years ago, was just a natural at this stuff. And so for his capstone project, he decided to build a device that could be used in behavioral testing based on what he learned in the class. And MJ, as he goes by, I sent him to Adafruit. It's a company out of Brooklyn that sells all these parts. And we found these little LED panels that are able to dynamically create visual stimuli and hook them up to Arduinos. And you can put three of them into a behavioral chamber and send the outputs back to our commercial control system. And the rats learn to go to different patterns on these little LED grids. And we can change them on the fly so we can look at decision making. And for his capstone project, he worked out the device, got a basic experiment done. Samantha White, who just graduated, replicated the behavioral experiment. We're writing it up this summer. And then MJ was graduating and wanted to find something to do. And we thought, why don't we think about trying to share what you did and maybe we can open up a website, Lex Kravitz said, it's called Open Behavior, and let's start sharing stuff. So uh, we did that because Lex was also building things himself at NIDDK. This is called Robucket. Um, it's for keeping mice in little buckets and measuring their metabolism over very long periods of time. He works at the National Institute of, for Diabetes and, and, and Digestive uh, and Kidney Diseases, and they, they're looking at things like obesity. So how do you track a whole lot of mice that might be transgenic and know they're feeding moment by moment? So they, they basically took literal buckets and put some Arduinos on them and feeders on them and hooked up a wireless system. And we were at Guapo's one night and having margaritas. And he was showing me his mouse. Right now, the mice, mice are eating, and it's on, it's on his phone. Um, and this is a real major innovation. So NIH was happy about it. And so together, we, we got this thing going, Open Behavior. It's a pretty plain website right now, but we have, um, I think, up to 50 projects now posted. This one came in recently. We have one more going this week. This is from a group at Harvard that developed a system for tracking Drosophila fruit flies as they move around in their different conditions where you can change their genome and look at how they move, how they feed. Um, for under $100, under $100, you can build this system. And it, it doesn't exist, right? But how do you do it? So all the designs for this have been shared. They have a website. We've highlighted it. We tweet about it. Um, we have a pretty active Twitter account. Just last week, Lex took part in, a, in an online chat on Hackaday, which is a website that does a lot of these makerspace projects. And we're going to partner with them now going forward to put more designs online, videos, instruction manuals, and such. So it's been an active, fun project to do. Um, and then the brain initiative came along. Right? So these tools for neuroscience I haven't talked about yet, optogenetics and calcium imaging, in the last 15 years have really been developed. And they're really changing how we do neuroscience experiments. Um, President Obama really supported a special fund of money to work on these tools. Initial, I think it was $80 million at first, and it's been renewed. We hope it continues. The government right now, this might get cut. It's, it's an Obama program. I hope they keep it going. It's a fantastic uh, support for many, many people. And what they worked on, largely, are a couple different methods. One of them is called optogenetics. Mm -hmm. If you watch the video at the bottom, this is a mouse that has a virus placed into its hypothalamus, a part of the brain that controls feeding. And you'll see this little implant on its head will become bright, and the mouse starts to feed. And it's a laser that's stimulating neurons that have this thing called channelodopsin in them. And when it turns off, the mouse kind of stops eating and walks around. This mouse is not food restricted. Light comes back on, and the mouse starts eating again. And they were able to show in this paper they found a part of the hypothalamus these cells that actually control feeding behavior. Um, and this is a typical experiment that's been done. There's been studies done on deep brain stimulation to treat Parkinson's disease, for example, that they showed. The way it works is people have taken ion channels that are in algae and bacteria that are light sensitive. And when light hits these little proteins, ions will flow into a cell or out of a cell and make the cell more or less active. So you can have like a sodium channel type for channelodopsin or a chloride channel that'll bring in chloride, make cells less active. It's called halorhodopsin, or a proton pump that basically changes the electrical concentrations across the cell's membranes. And all these channels are light sensitive. So blue light, green light, red light will activate them and produce changes in behavior. So this is one of the main innovations that Brain Initiative has, has supported. And everyone is using this now. There's papers, you know, you talk about papers that are coming out, right? many papers per week with optogenetics in every journal out there. And then calcium imaging, and this is a busy slide. But what it, we show is GFP, green fluorescent protein, is conjugated to a calcium binding protein. And when calcium binds to calmodulin, it's called, it changes the configuration of this fluorescent protein and makes it fluoresce. 
So when calcium binds this complex molecule, green light gets emitted. So you can get this in the cells using viral tools, and in this case, a fish, you can record across its entire nervous system simultaneously. A zebrafish. It's actually in water. It's alive. It's in Genelia Farm, where they did this work in Virginia. And they're able to record the entire nervous system of the zebrafish with calcium imaging. The lower stack is two-photon imaging of the hippocampus of an awake rat. Um, and so at the time this imaging was done, the animal was awake, and all the cells in this part of the brain could be imaged using these tools. So this is really groundbreaking for the field. We could not do this 15 years ago. None of the technologies existed. These have been the major focus of brain, along with anatomy, co co connectomics it's called, computational anatomy, trying to make sense of lots of anatomical data. But behavior was left out. As an example of really good behavior from that, that period of time, um, this is a really crazy thing, the two-photon two mouse air hockey system, as it was described in the blog. It's a styrofoam ball with air blowing below it, and a mouse is positioned on the ball, and the mouse then has a, a ball that spins, and the mouse then drives a signal to an optical mouse, a computer mouse, and you can actually track the mouse's movement on the ball in real time. And then you can also, just by putting a small plate on its head, hook up a two-photon system and image its brain in real time as it runs on this ball. This was developed at Princeton by David Kank's lab. <coughs> and if you know about Quake or Doom, old video games, uh, they used Quake to make virtual mazes that these mice ran on on the trackball to go find food. So it's a pretty cool design. Published 10 years ago and documented in the paper, but not really so well that people could replicate it very easily. And um, many labs have figured it out, but the dissemination was not good. And so th this lab, particularly Kank's lab, developed a lot of the tools that we're using now for calcium imaging and optogenetics, but never really got this out there. So part of the goal is a lot of people would like to use the newer behavioral tasks we have, the simple things we need, like pumps to, to deliver rewards, sensors for when animals make a choice. <coughs> and we're going to get all this stuff on the website. Part of the critique of brain came from a paper that was published in Neuron, um, I think now last year by a group of researchers who felt that there's just too much of a reductionistic tendency in neuroscience right now. We're worrying about ion channels, cell types, very specific questions about how brain cells wire, but we're leaving behind the questions about how the system itself works and how it really controls behavior. And this article was picked up by The Atlantic. There was a lot of social media commentary on it, some fairly hostile stuff actually on Twitter, and brain was criticized. And I think because of this article and the general feeling in the community that request to do something that would really um, improve behavioral technology as well came along. So they asked us to put something together, and um, Lex and I reached out to Adam Kepix, who's at Cold Spring Harbor. His lab developed VPOD, the little mouse box we showed earlier, and we got a project going. So we have three aims. We hope they fund it. It's reviewed next month. Um, the first aim will basically turn the, the system from Adam's lab into an open source platform for doing behavioral experiments. We're going to call it Open Behavior Platform. And we'll provide training in neuroscience meetings, as well as workshops at Cold Spring Harbor, here at AU, and at NIH on using this system. We're going to disseminate tools for neuroscience research by working with Hackaday um, and a forum we're going to launch, and the Society for Neuroscience as well, to get information out on how these tools work. And training materials. We're going to make videos. We hooked up with a company, local company, that does videos for the national museums and start producing uh, really clearly documented ways of putting these tools together and writing instruction manuals. It'll fund three postbacks across our labs here, um, as well as a lab manager for the project and a number of engineers at Cold Spring Harbor, so it's a pretty good opportunity to really raise the tech side of what we do in neuroscience on campus. And I, I don't want to bore you, but just, just, just to show you why this matters, we, we thought a lot about writing this proposal. And one of the first things was time-strapped investigators, you don't need to read all this, but time-strapped investigators really need this project, right? We're, to do research, you're really busy. So many competing demands. Who has time to sit down and figure all this out? If you can go to a website, like when I got my, my leaf blower last fall, I had never used it, right? So I went to YouTube, like, how does this thing start? And somebody had a video. And, and, and it's, you know, we had a problem in our car, and my wife went, how do I change the light? Well, there's a video on YouTube. Like, we need that for those kinds of, the majority of researchers right now. Time-strapped people, stressed out. They want to get their research going. The forgotten postdoc, another type of person that really could benefit from this, because a lot of folks make tools and they get used in the labs they work in, and then they kind of disappear. And these folks don't always get faculty jobs. There's no way to cite a device unless you publish a methods paper, which doesn't have high impact usually, unless it's used by everybody. So what we worked on is a plan with a company or a group called SciCrunch, an organization called SciCrunch at UCSD, that provides something called RRIDs, 
research resource identifiers. So they're used now for antibodies and viruses in molecular research, but they haven't been used for hardware. So if you make a new tool, you can now get a tag for that tool, and as it's used, the RRID is cited, and now you actually get credit for what you did. And this should help incentivize people to make tools. Obviously, the confused grad student needs help. Um, the cash strapped senior investigator <laughs> sometimes can't afford things you really want to do, and the well funded senior investigator still might want to do the latest thing from nature. And if you get people to share, they're doing it next week. So everybody wins if we do this, and we hope that the study section likes the proposal. Um, again, we hooked up with Hackaday. We now have about six projects posted to hackaday.io as part of a, a new behavioral neuroscience um, sub project, and we get a few more done this summer. We have a formal partnership with them. It doesn't hurt us that Sophie Kravitz is one of the founders of the company, Alexa's sister, so we're able to get this one going. And there's no conflict of interest. We've checked into all that with NIH. Um, there's nothing, nothing commercial out of this project. It's purely, it's a, I said it's hippie science. We're not making any money on this. It's just <laughs> helping everybody out. Discourse forums, SciCrunch, and Society for Neuroscience, they've been very happy to help us too with this. Um, yeah, so I don't want to bore you. I might be out of time, but we just really want to try to incentivize things. You get a new device, we put it on our website. People check it out. They try to replicate it. We have forums. They interact with developers. Devices are updated through that feedback. Eventually, people will publish. We help get them an RID. The work gets cited. Researchers have incentives to share. So, um, yeah, so that's the general project, open behavior. And um, the people involved in my lab, Linda and Sam, have done all the Twitter work on the account, and it's gotten some really nice followers. Hannah, Kyra, and MJ really set the website up and got it going. Um, we're going to have a lot more to post in the next week. Lex and his lab, not just him, other people in his group have contributed to this. Adam now. And support with Lex, we've gotten support through post-bac funding for the summer to keep the project going. And here locally, some money that I get from the university each year, plus the NASA STEM grant we got last year, kept the undergrads in the lab to really keep them actively posting. So it's been a good thing. And again, thanks to the women in my lab. They're amazing. Um, and thank you for listening. Open behavior. So my, my question is, um, not that long ago, there has been um, some publications questioning the replicability of science across all disciplines. Um, the problem that um, based on publications alone, nobody can find the code, the underlying data, the instruments, the tools, the software in order to replicate or reproduce published scientific findings, generally speaking. And my question is, how much of a problem do you think that really is in reality in your disciplines? And because we're recording, if you would speak into the microphone, we would appreciate it. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a major problem, personally. I think that there's been a lot of the haves and have-nots in my field. Um, and there are social networks that exist. Um, and I think there are people that have helped each other and others that have avoided each other. And I think if everything is open, then those social factors are gone and whatever's there can be re-implemented. And, and the NIH has pushed rigor and reproducibility now in all grants. And I'm on a study section in a couple weeks. There's now an entire page that has to be filled out about this. So rigor meaning that the science is good, it's justified, but the reproducibility has to be there. You have to share your data, you have to share your code. And it hasn't really been pushed as hard as it needs to be. but. I've been trying to get this done since the 1990s when I was a grad student. I had people just openly laugh at me when I said, can I, can I ask if you'd share your data? Or how about I have developed some code I'd love to try on your, on your data. I'll give you the code. People just don't want to do it back then. And then as a PI, I could kind of see why. I mean, it's very competitive. But you still hold yourself back. And you can get by a lot faster with friends that help each other as opposed to, I don't, this whole competitor mindset in science to me makes no sense. Uh, sure. So um, I edit a journal in, in uh, the social sciences where we do replication very poorly on average. But this journal requires that every article be replicated by a grad student. In fact, he's over there, <laughs> Simon. <laughs> um, and what we found in, in this experience is that about 95% of the authors give us something that's really easy to replicate. 
and then about 5%, it's a mess. And they hadn't thought about replication from day one. They sort of post hoc did it. They've got weird computer languages they're using. Um, and we really need to get better about that in the social sciences. So the particular social science that was, uh, came under scrutiny with psychology in terms of its replicability, and uh, people who have been attempting to repeat some of the experiments have been unsuccessful. And uh, I think that message has been um, heard and people are paying attention. So not quite as extensive as you're describing in the natural sciences, but I think the social sciences have a ways to go in terms of, of these issues. I have a variation of the question is, I mean, what you're creating is the scientific YouTube and um, what is, and this seems to be something that government, uh, like an NIH, uh, should be interested in assisting you at a larger scale than, than um, you know, I mean, what you're doing is great, but is there some interest in developing this as a national platform or even an international right. platform? Right, so that's actually what we started the conversation. We met with people after the Society for Neuroscience meeting, which was in D.C. this past fall from the Brain Initiative. We had, we had a lunch with them about this issue, and the idea was that to get this going as a first step would be key in five years and probably be what it would need would be needed to really get a basic platform going for sharing and dissemination, and then to work with the National Library of Medicine. And, and, and again, having an intramural collaborator makes that a lot easier because um, you know it's, he's, he's right there. And that was actually a long-term part of the plan because um, you can't handle this and you can't archive it all. No university really should be responsible for it. I mean, we're gonna be backing stuff up like crazy, right, in, in the short term. And, and um, it's important that everybody we've, we've talked with has no uh, rights on any of the content and um, can provide at fairly low cost full access to any dis discussion forum or anything else. But it has to eventually go to a larger scale, and that's key. So we want to partner with two other projects, Open EFIS um, and Open Optogenetics, that have exist existed now for a while for, for the next stage of this kind of thing and, and really get um, a larger infrastructure going for that, exactly that purpose. I mean, what's the cost of something like this to go to scale? Good question. I mean, the, the, it's in the order of about twenty-five thousand a year for the various forms and archiving fees. Um, Hackaday, for example. Part of that is they want us to give them help with posting banner ads because their reason to be in this is to keep people doing electronics. And so our banner ads are not about their stuff; it's about our project, like getting people to come to the website. And so that's one of the kind of quid pro quos. We can store stuff on their systems as long as we help generate more traffic for the website. And in this case, it's, it's really just targeting us and SFN ads, Society for Neuroscience ads, not tools or companies. So it seems okay to us. But the more you build these very large projects and that they're computer-based, either for display, for, for sharing, et cetera, or the basic analysis, what levels of protection do you put from the, the sincere, dedicated hacker or the bumbler? And this is another major issue for ours. Is it, I think it is really for both pass, of you, yeah. Password protection, et cetera, and having active. The idea is to get three post backs, as we call them, or community scientists that will actually monitor the project. But it could be that in the middle of the night when no one's watching, something goes down. So we are using commercial. Not, they're not com I mean, they're commercial, but they're not um, product-driven practices that are already established and running on lots of sites. I mean, the forms we're going to use are used by Society for Neuroscience and a whole lot of startup tech companies for interacting with users, so yeah. it's, it's not like we're using something ourselves. We would not roll our own on that. <coughs> right. Yeah. Other question? In back. And if you would stand, please, and you have a microphone. Oh, sorry. Uh, Provost Bass had a lot of interesting metrics about American University, but I saw one that was missing, and I wondered if you might speak to this. Uh, we were talking this morning about these new ways of measuring research to policy interface and research to policy translation, and it seems to me that American University is pretty exceptional in this one metric. Can, can you speak to that? Is that your perception? No, <laughs> it's not my perception. Um, the part of the dialogue, if you're really talking about in public policy, and uh, certainly my colleague can speak to it, is you look at the Kennedy School in terms of the kinds of translation and the communication and the press conferences. Um, I haven't had a single major press conference on a ma release of a major study at this institution since I've been here for a decade. That the weight uh, of of influence is not just in our perception, it is the perception of others. And what those metrics are showing you is how others perceive us. 
And so I would say we have to, we, we're doing some very good stuff. It's still, we're in Washington. It needs to play at, a, at another level. It needs to collaborate. I mean, look at Brookings. We actually spend time with Brookings in terms of how they disseminate and how they move topics into uh, the wider uh, area, who we need to partner with, who may have stronger skills in that area. And I would say in our future, as we're talking about what we're going to be doing in, say, the School of Public Affairs, I would say this is an area that we're going to double down on. Um, and I also want to say that the purpose of what I'm putting up here is not to be um, critical of other efforts that are in altmetrics area. It's simply to say what we are not doing that others are doing that are measured by others and are valued by others that's important for the institution in addition to not to take away from the other kinds of interactions that are important in the institution. And we can talk further about this uh, area because it's an important area. It's an area I've personally been very active in and earlier in my career. Um, and so I'm not speaking just as a commentary as someone who has been in the forefront of translational work, moving things into uh, wider arenas and having it um, front page of the major uh, newspapers in terms of breakthroughs and those kinds of things as well as I think Jeff can speak to those kinds of uh, issues as well. Am I answering your question? Okay, thank you. Okay. Question here. Wait for your microphone, it's coming to you. Hi, I just had a question about, um, so there's, there's things that the researchers can do in order to increase citations, and I'm wondering what a use plans are for kind of presenting new translational platforms, because it seems to me like one of the, the biggest problems is, is really that we don't have the platforms that the Kennedy School has for being able to get our research out there. In fact, many times we send our researchers to other institutions, to some of the think tanks around town, in order to launch their work because we know that'll get more eyes on their research. So are there any things in the works right now for improving that at AU? Yes, but I can't disclose that at this time. <laughs> yes, there are plans. Um, but what I wanna come back to is the traditional, where, what journals that are used by, in this case, social scientists, um, is their choice of array. And that what you've seen is the, the placement in terms of moving it within the academic circles is terribly important. It really makes a difference. And it's much harder to get in some of these very selective journals. And the language and the way your work is done takes a lot of time to get right. Now, we've heard some examples of open source which can move quicker. Some of our journals um, can take, and I've been an editor of a journal, um, a year is not an unusually long time from the point of receipt, and we date, everything's dated, how long it takes and getting it out. Um, the translational portion is of value to the institution. Um, it's another way of building institutional pride, but nothing will take the place of the traditional measures of research, which are, as the, the, my, my two colleagues here have done, is external funding, placement in the top journals, being building those citations, being recognized as an expert, then being tapped nationally and leadership roles. Um, that's part of the career. And we need, because we have a lot of now very talented junior people, we need to provide the mentorship and guidance so they see that pathway. And the translation is a, a, a component allied with the recognition among their colleagues in other respected venues and places. Can I Go react ahead. to yeah. that as well? Or Go, Go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe I'm stepping into waters that aren't my own. But to me, it seems the one thing that made it helpful to me was getting out and giving talks um, before you publish, going to as many conferences and department seminars as possible, and really getting the stuff out there before it's submitted, and going to conferences and having to students and postdocs presenting. Because if you don't do it, if you just write it and send it off, no one knows that you're even doing it. And if you're not going to a lot of conferences, especially in science, if you're not, and collaborating with people outside the university, it's great that we have a lot of interest in collaborating on campus, but we need a lot of out of the bubble collaborations. And I just think that would help a lot of more junior people um, really get their reputations out there. It's, it's, it is actually your external colleagues, is, and maybe more than your internal colleagues ultimately that determine your fate. You build your readership by, you know, 
Yeah, you got to get it out there. We had this cool finding and just keep showing up <laughs> and, and, and keep talking about it until you get it published. But, but it's also not just talking to people who share your particular point of view. It's getting it to wider audiences yes. that are yeah. significant and they see a connection that they didn't see yes. before. Yes. Jeff, you had a comment. And they also write tenure letters. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to answer that question by pointing out something that Harvard does really well, which is um, the faculty web pages are designed by this organization called Open Scholar, which recently went private. Um, when you go in and you update your web page with a new publication, it automatically goes to Google Scholar, ResearchGate, Mendeley, and some others I can't remember. So in other words, they've rigged the system so that just routine things that faculty do get dispersed electronically to the whole world. Um, and it's not that expensive. <laughs> yeah, and just one more, more follow-up. St I still have colleagues who are not in Google Scholar, which blows my mind. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I just don't understand yeah. it. You have to be in Google Scholar. And so when, if you're on a study section or an NSF panel, that's the thing that people do. They look you up, and if it comes up in Google, that you can, they can see who you are. Yeah. So there are people here who have not done it, and I don't know why. Yeah. Research gate is a little kind of annoyed by that. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. Right. Yeah. Right. And we do have people who will help <coughs> you do that. Your question. Um, I have... Uh, Two different questions. Um, the first one is a lot of your work was, or you talked to both of you about data replication. Um, and one of the questions I have is, are you publishing on sort of your results, which would be replicated from your experiments and your, your terrorism and violence research? And are you also publishing on um, the pitfalls, if you like? I mean, you were talking about the devices and you were talking about the difficulties of data collection. Is there two research agendas here um, with very different publication outlets? Um, you know, one is sort of more methodological uh, and then the other one is more results to the field more broadly. Um, and my second question is really to the provost. And what we're finding in my field in the social sciences is that, and there's been a number of reports, is that women and particularly minorities are about one in 10% less cited. And for us, that's a real difficulty. And I'm wondering if there's any strategic planning to think about, you know, if I times my research by 10, I would be probably the, the top, you know, cited person in SIS. And I'm saying that because we do see it in the field. And I, it's very, very important. Well, I think the first, and just on a second point here, is that um, I am reading the same statistics and it is of concern. Um, and it's just coming out as some work in economics that's been showing some differential uh, in particular. And I think the first is, is in any change process, first is acknowledging and getting that information out. Um, and this has been uh, fairly widely circulated now inside higher education in the Chronicle. And that's the first stage is awareness of a differential. Um, many journals, of course, are blind reviewed. So that should mask uh, some of that information, certainly my the journals I've been involved with um, are blind reviewed. So that should not be a factor. But again, these are the statistics, and we need to pay attention to them. Okay. We would not. Okay. Second question. Um, Carla, we'll come back to you. The, there was the other question. The answer to the other one is yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they're equally valued? They're valued by different constituencies. Um, so I'm, I'm a statistician, which means I can be eclectic about the substantive interests that I have. That's why I do bi biomedical research and social science research. Um, but I, I talk to different audiences in, in those two camps and within methodology versus substance. And it depends on who I'm working with. Yeah. You know. But all of the above. It's changed. <laughs> Neuroscience has changed where methodology recently has become a lot more high profile with these tools, where previously I don't think it was. Um, so now there are groups just living on technique. And it's great for them because they don't have to get into arguments about hypotheses or who's right or wrong. It just works or it doesn't. So, but the field's <laughs> changing. Your other point is there's a really cool um, website that's been started by Yal Niv at Princeton called Bias NeuroWatch, which posts every single conference that's announced. Um, it's gender breakdown and the expected funding rates um, based on NIH mm -hmm. portfolios. And it's keeping a lot of conferences honest. And I'm involved in a conference we've had for two cycles now, a spreadsheet. We're really looking at this, like making sure that our distributions match our invites of speakers should match the distributions and actually overemphasizing women invites because it's often harder, especially for more junior women with, yeah. who may have Get away. kids and just getting away. So we've put a lot of effort into that and they haven't hit our new one yet, but we'll hear soon when it goes public. So. Crowley, you get the last comment and then I get to do the thank yous. Actually, stand up and just speak loudly.
essentially a craft or it's a uh, youth initiative and youth effort. Uh, so if you have uh, schoolmakers all around the world or if you're looking at data sets that are in the public domain, why do you need to enlist them? How do you make, now that's a large For, for salary. <laughs> definitely come around that because I would never have done this project if I stayed in my former job where I had to pay 90% of my salary. No one paid, I didn't pay and my salary went down every year if I didn't have the right amount of money. I never would try this in that setting. Um, the only reason we're able to make this work, the three of us at least, is one of, one of us is an intramural scientist who had permission to do this. The other is at Cold Spring Harbor who has a massive endowment and while they, he needs grants, he's well funded. This is not a huge risk for him and we're also pretty established. I would not recommend to people who are starting out that they do this. You are, you are a lone wolf, sadly, until you get yourself on the map. <laughs> but then later on, it's actually really fun and, and can be well-funded if it's done right. So, yeah. yeah. And I would say also that teamwork or individual work, th these aren't either or. These are combinations is that, for example, the faculty member here who worked on LIGO has his own publications, his own work, but it's part of this, this large very influential network that won a Nobel Prize. So it, it is, it, I'm a big fan of collaborative work. I, I think that, that the, um, the opportunities of exchanging things that others wouldn't have seen, and I, and I include that even in the, the tradition of the solo book, is I think that, that no one can ever know everything. And so our job is to promote the creation of knowledge, disseminate that information, and so teamwork is, is a, a positive thing, and I think we're, we're seeing a more openness to that in universities in terms of the views, uh, in terms of evaluation and assessment. It's certainly something as provost I have been explicitly supportive across disciplines um, to bring people together. Would you join me in thanking this panel for this presentation? Thank you.